Do you guys have that combo in KFC where you have the chicken breast along with the other parts of the chicken and then on the side there's a bowl of mashed potato with coleslaw? Because if you do, I'm going to change your perception of that meal. That very meal is the last meal of choice of one of the worst killers in Malaysia, Mona Fendi. Her case was a huge sensation back then because this is how she reacted when she was given the death penalty. This case involves human greed, the murder of a very respected politician, and a fallen dream of a singer turned black magic practitioner who found success. Okay. Let's go to the year 1987 when all of this story began. Mazna Ismail, also known as Mona Fendi, just debuted her first album called Diana. She adopted the stage name Mona Fendi to boost her popularity and made a few television appearances but as far as her singing career went, that was it. Her limelight as a celebrity was short-lived, that is until she started to pursue a career as a witch doctor. For the western audience watching, I know the superstitious belief in ghosts and magic isn't as accepted nowadays, nor is it the most popular, but keep in mind that this was back in the 90s and the world was a lot different back then. Also not to mention, Malaysians belief in the supernatural didn't really change much even now. And this is why when Mona Fendi started to practice black magic, she found success. She only serves people from the upper class, where she provides them lucky charms and talismans which supposedly will grant them all of their wishes and desires. And the reason why most of her clients were politicians makes sense, as they believe that by dealing with Mona Fendi, they'd be able to secure their position of power in the fierce political scene in Malaysia. This is not to say that practices of black magic are a norm by any means in Malaysia, neither it is seen as something that is respected by the people there, but rather the opposite. As Islam became dominant in the region, it clashes with their beliefs because black magic is regarded as the biggest sin any Muslim can commit and Mona Fendi was a Muslim. But regardless, the influence of the Javanese belief before Islam still lingers in the Malaysian community today, which is why black magic is still practiced but only privately. This is why Datuk Mazlan Idris, one of the UMNO political members who was rumored to be competing for the chief minister position, started to consult Mona privately. Mona Fendi gave him an irresistible offer by giving him the power of invincibility by owning the two talismans consisting of a cane and a Malay traditional hat called Songkok, supposedly owned by the former Indonesian president Sukarno. As I mentioned, the supernatural beliefs of the people in the Southeast Asia is really potent and they believe that these items possess powerful magic which is how the former president is so respected by his people. In return, Mona Fendi demanded 2.5 million ringgit. This is where it gets confusing because some sources claim that Mazlan paid a deposit of 500,000 ringgit and gave them 10 land titles as a guarantee of the remaining payment. But other sources never mention any of those claims. But rather, shortly before Mazlan was murdered, he had withdrawn 300,000 from various banks. But what was confirmed was Mona Fendi invited Mazlan to her house in Kampung Peru Paha to conduct a flower bath ritual that was supposed to make him rich. Mona told Mazlan to lie on the floor face up with his eyes closed as she placed flowers all over his body. During this session, Afandi, Mona's husband, and Juraimi, Mona's helper, were also present. Mona had instructed Mazlan to wait for the money to fall from the sky. But what he found was only her assistant swinging an axe three times on his neck, severing his head. The first few days of Muslan's disappearance didn't raise any suspicions. Only until a week had passed and he was still unreachable that they became concerned about his safety. The trio almost got away with the murder because the police didn't find any leads in their search for Muslan's whereabouts. That is until Juraimi was caught for a drug violation unrelated to the murder. Perhaps Juraimi admitted his role in Mazlan's murder because he felt extreme remorse or because he wanted to exact revenge on the couple for only paying him 180 ringgit for handling Mazlan's body. The motive of the murder is believed to be because of money because 8 hours after the murder, the couple went shopping, splurging on a new Mercedes-Benz for 125,000 ringgit, a new phone for 10,000 ringgit, jewelries for 40,000 and furnitures up to 20,000. Two weeks after that is when Mona had her infamous facelift which cost 13,000 ringgit. I'm not sure how you guys think of her new facelift but Malaysians are petrified of how she looks like and I can't blame them because she does look terrifying. 
Anyways, all three of them were arrested for the murder of Maslan Idris on the night of 20th July 1993 and only three days later was when his body was found in a pit dismembered 18 times. They were convicted by a seven-person jury in Timurlaw High Court who found all three of them guilty and sentenced them to death by hanging. The hangings were scheduled on Friday, November 2, 2001 at the Kajang prison. The three filed appeals to the federal court which the court dismissed and as a last resort, they sought clemency which the Pahang Pardons Board declined to grant. The case was such a huge sensation back then because not only was the case involving black magic and the brutal murder of a prominent politician, but Mona's strange reaction elevated it to a whole new level because upon getting her death sentence, she reacted gleefully and with a wide smile on her face as she remarked, I'm happy and thank you to all Malaysians. Mona displayed no remorse for her action during the eight years between her arrest and her death and was often seen to be in a cheerful mood. She was always wearing bright attire, smiling and posing for the cameras. When she was escorted before the court, she said, Looks like I have a lot of fans. Rumors about paranormal occurrences started to emerge, where people say Mona frequently used her supernatural abilities to escape her cell for a drink and return before daybreak. The prison officer, however, denied this. Mona and Afandi were allowed to see their families the day before their execution to say their final goodbyes and had KFC as their last meal. Mona, Afandi, and Juraimi were hanged to death simultaneously on Friday at 5.59 a.m. Mona's last words before being hanged were, I will never die. Her final words are quite eerie and it is open for a lot of interpretation and it still echoes to this day because as you are watching this video now, many Malaysians are afraid of talking about Mona Fendi's case even after all these years because her story has been associated with a curse that if you were to talk about her story, something bad will happen to you. This is probably why when you search up her name, you'll find a lot of spooky stories about her jail cell and her house that was left abandoned. However, one interpretation of her final remarks that cannot be denied is that her case continues to shock people decades after her death.